The United States of America officially was born on the 4th of July, 1776, when 13 American colonies declared their independence from Great Britain. But independence didn't come easily. It took many years of hard and bloody fighting to win it. But what had happened to drive the colonies into a violent war against what was back then the world's most powerful nation? In order to find out, let us go back in time to the year 1763, 12 years before the Revolutionary War began. In 1763, a peace treaty had just been signed, ending a long series of costly conflicts between Britain and France, called the French and Indian Wars. France was the loser and was forced to hand over nearly all her American territory to Great Britain. In order to prevent bloodshed, France had tried to keep settlers out of the Indian hunting lands west of the Appalachian Mountains. After Great Britain took control of the region, the king did not want to fight another war in North America, so he forbid colonial settlement on the western lands. The king's proclamation angered many colonists, especially along the western frontier, who wanted to use the Indian lands for their own purposes. They believed that a king who ruled from far across the ocean couldn't possibly understand the colonists' needs and had no right to limit where they settled. That was how the troubles in the colonies began. But there were many more soon to come. Up until 1764, Britain hadn't interfered much with the way her colonies were run. The government had maintained an informal policy of healthy neglect. As a result, the colonies were somewhat independent and weren't used to being told what to do. But the British government had gone deeply in debt fighting France, and it desperately needed money. So it was decided that the colonies had to help pay for their own defense. To raise this money, Parliament made a new law called the Sugar Act. It required payment of a tariff on imported items such as molasses, sugar, wine, and coffee. Tariffs were supposed to be used to regulate trade. However, some Americans realized that the tariffs imposed by the Sugar Act were just a thinly disguised way of getting them to pay new taxes. The tariffs upset a lot of people because the colonies were not allowed to have representatives in Parliament to stand up for their rights. The most outspoken person on the subject was Samuel Adams of Boston, who declared that the Sugar Act was illegal because the right of taxation was a power that should belong only to the people or their elected representatives. The British government responded to the protests over the Sugar Act by reducing the tax by two-thirds. But they also enacted a new law called the Stamp Act. It required them to pay for tax stamps like this one that were put on paper goods such as almanacs, newspapers, and official documents. But the Stamp Act ended up causing even more trouble than the Sugar Act not only because the taxes on paper goods were high, but also because taxation had once again been enacted without colonial representation in Parliament. The Stamp Act really made people mad. It caused riots in colonial port cities, and a few government buildings were even destroyed. John Adams of Boston called for representatives from each colony to meet and come up with a plan for resisting unfair taxation. In the end, only nine colonies participated. But what came to be called the Stamp Act Congress was a turning point in the movement toward independence because the colonies discovered they had much greater strength when they acted as a group 
rather than separately. The Stamp Act was repealed the next year, but the government did not want to appear weak, and so before that law was repealed, the king approved a new law called the Declaratory Act. The purpose of this act was to make it clear to the colonists that the British government had the right to tax them as they saw fit, and the fact that the colonists were not allowed to have representation in Parliament did not change things at all. Even before the Declaratory Act was approved, Parliament had already passed another law intended to save the government money. It was called the Quartering Act and required colonial towns to provide shelter and supplies for the British troops in their localities. This was an unpopular law as well and when the colony of New York tried to resist paying for the soldiers' upkeep, the British government shut down their legislature. In response, angry merchants in colonial ports boycotted, that is, refused to buy, British goods until the Quartering Act was changed. The next move on the part of the British, who by now were getting pretty fed up with the colonists, was the enactment in 1767 of the Townshend Acts. These laws created indirect taxes called duties on imported items including tea, glass, lead, paint, and paper. The following year, to make sure the new laws were enforced, Britain sent a fleet of ships carrying two regiments of troops to occupy Boston. The government provided its troops with special documents called writs of assistance, authorizing them to carry out searches to find tax cheaters. Of course, the government's actions just made the Americans even matter. So, once again, the colonies exerted economic pressure on the British by boycotting their goods. The boycott was mostly successful because by 1770, all the towns and duties on imported goods, except the one on tea, had been revoked. In March of that year, five colonists died in Boston when an unruly crowd protesting against taxation was fired upon by frightened British troops. Immediately, the Boston Massacre, as they called it, was used by American patriots to fan the flames of revolution. And one way this was done was by writing letters. Starting in 1772, patriots from across the far-flung colonies began to organize committees of correspondence to increase communication between them. Through their letters, the committees of correspondence were able to share new ideas about government, law, and how to deal with threats to American liberty. And they played an important role in uniting the colonies as they moved ever closer to revolution. One of the biggest moves toward revolution was taken in 1773, and it was all about tea and taxes. Back then, tea was everyone's favorite non-alcoholic drink and people drank quite a lot of it. But because it was still being taxed, many merchants smuggled tea into the colonies from Holland. In the meantime, British tea piled up unsold in warehouses, and taxes remained uncollected. So the government decided to lure the colonists into buying British tea by selling it at a lower price than the Dutch. Patriots led by Sam Adams, saw the plan as a trick, a roundabout way of getting them to agree to a tax they didn't believe in. So, when ships carrying British tea arrived in Boston, they were boarded by patriots, some thinly disguised as Mohawk Indians, who dumped the expensive cargo into the harbor, while crowds on the shore looked on in startled amazement. The Boston Tea Party, as it was soon called, provoked outrage among the rulers back in Britain and ended up causing a lot of trouble. 
the government quickly passed laws intended to punish the Massachusetts Bay Colony and to force its citizens into obedience. In America, these laws came to be known as the Intolerable Acts because they made living in Massachusetts extremely difficult. As a result of the Intolerable Acts, extra troops were sent to the colony to maintain order. Boston's harbor was shut down, trade suffered badly, and the Massachusetts legislature was suspended, disrupting the colony's government. Immediately, committees of correspondence sent off letters. They warned of what might happen if Britain suspended other colonial legislatures and suggested that representatives from every colony meet to find ways of resisting the intolerable acts. In the fall of 1774, representatives from all the colonies except Georgia met in Philadelphia. Their historic meeting was called the First Continental Congress and was attended by George Washington of Virginia. After a little over two weeks of debate, the Continental Congress, hoping to put economic pressure on Britain, requested the colonists to stop sending them exports until a new way of preserving American liberties could be found. At this time, the colonies weren't actually seeking independence. They just wanted their old rights back. Nevertheless, the actions of the Continental Congress were unmistakably those of a real government. As a matter of fact, Congress even advised that the colonies should start preparing their citizens for the possibility of war. As we have just seen, a long series of events starting with the closing of the West to colonial settlement in 1763 and ending with the Intolerable Acts and the First Continental Congress in 1774 had taken the American colonies to the brink of war with Britain. Clearly, many colonists disliked being told what to do, disliked being expected to obey without a word of disagreement, and hated being taxed without being allowed to have representation in Parliament. Beyond that, there were other factors at work, because by 1774, 167 years had passed since the founding of the first English colony at Jamestown, Virginia. Over such a long period of time, the majority of colonists had developed deep connections with the land and people of America. As this happened, their patriotism slowly shifted away from far off Britain to the familiar colonies in which they lived. And it was all of these things that helped set the stage for the birth of the new American nation. True or false? The Quartering Act put a 25 cent tax on every pound of tea. True or false? The proclamation of 1763 forbid colonial settlement west of the Appalachians. True or false, the First Continental Congress was held to deal with the intolerable acts. True or false, refusing to buy certain goods for political reasons is called a boycott. True or false, a writ of assistance was a special tax on paper goods.